because it flies in the face of all good reason and all evidence. There has been no public discussion on the findings of criminologists with respect to this bill. The political focus has been on creating a moral panic and a sense of fear with absolutely not one shred, and I am not overstating this, there is not one shred of evidence, real data-based evidence to support anything in this bill. And the fuel of this moral panic is the myth that building more jails will prevent crime. Building more jails does not prevent crime. Canada already stands at the front of the line for incarcerating youth. Compared with every other OECD country, we come second only to Mexico. And the country with which we can be best compared is the United Kingdom, where we jail 15.4% of our young and put them in custody, and they jail 3%. And their investment in prevention has created a decline in crime. Ironically, we're also experiencing a decline in crime and still are jailing far more youth than we need to. And Bruce Parisien has already spoken to our over-incarceration of First Nations youth. It is an international point of shame for us because we really do not only over-incarcerate and over-represent adult male and female, and particularly female, in our jails, we are vastly over-representing our First Nations young people there as well. Girls, again, far more than boys, but at the level of 44%. And British Columbia, at the moment, has the wonderful privilege of over-incarcerating to the degree that 58% of the girls that are in our youth custody centers for administrative offenses, this is not a crime, but an administrative offense, which is like violating a probation order, that's what it is. So how many of you are parents of adolescents? If your adolescent girl came home half an hour late, would you put her in jail? That is the violation of a probation order that can get you put in custody, where you can wait until you have time to meet with your probation officer, be seen by a judge, or perhaps assessed. And if you need to be assessed, you might wait as long as seven weeks for that assessment for the fact that you have violated a probation order. This is not justice. This is not um, serving to prevent crime. This is playing in to the whole question of crime in a way that is embarrassing and completely wrong with respect to what will actually prevent crime. Marginalized, under-resourced communities, oppression, racism, and racialization, and no social mobility is what creates the potential for crime. Gender-based oppression and abuse and jailing people for their poverty is what is at bottom driving the growth in our criminal justice system while crime is in decline. We currently have the lowest murder rate we have had since 1966. And if you really want to know whether a, a society is going to hell in a handbasket, you look at the murder rate. And our murder rate is extremely low by comparison. The cost of dealing with a murder is typically about $17.5 million. A rape costs $448,532. A robbery, $335,000. An aggravated assault, $145,000. Thousand dollars, avoiding the costs resulting to the individual and society from becoming a career criminal amounts to a discounted present value of 2.6 to 5.3 million dollars. That is what prevention can do for us. So why in the world would we be investing in incarceration? Investing in disadvantaged young children creates high economic returns as high as 15 to 17 percent for every single dollar invested. Supported early childhood development contributes significantly to a lower incident of crime in later life and provides a return of $16.14 invested. With $11.30 or 88 percent of that investment 
from reduced incarcerations. Spending more and more on police, courts, and prisons does not reduce crime. And the evidence that shows what crime prevention can do is incontrovertible. It is so well constructed now that we can rely upon it. What I find really interesting about this debate, and I thought about it all day, what am I going to say to you? I find us standing here attempting to reason in an evidence-based way. I think we need to turn the argument around. This government is flying in the face of all evidence and is, in the name of public safety and protection, engaging in the subversion of the democratic process by distorting the facts. It is a subversion of the democratic process to distort the facts, to use fear to mislead the very public it is legally bound to protect. Government, any government at any level, has the fiduciary responsibility to act for the common good and to do so on the best possible evidence. Instead, our current federal government is moving to pass a law that we know through extremely well-documented evidence here in Canada and elsewhere, including Texas, in the Western industrialized world, will do exactly the opposite of what the law promises to do. And in the process, will attack our most vulnerable citizens and jail them where prevention and early intervention would be by far the better and more effective intervention. And these people, will be turned into the raw material that will provide jobs for the construction and surveillance industries as a backup for our mishandling of economic policy, starting with the lie of the cut tax mantra. This same government touts the Made in Canada notion of responsibility to protect on the international stage and is instead creating a lack of safety at home. And that is why we have to stand up against this bill. Thank you.